Hello, check. Hey, I want to read our scripture for the day. Is the scripture reading in there? Awesome, cool. Uh, we're going to be reading from Jeremiah chapter 31 um, and John chapter 1 from the New International Version today. So read along with me. <clears throat> the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And then out of John chapter 1, verse 12, uh, yet all who did receive him to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of your husband's will, but born of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, good morning, sisters and brothers. It is awesome to see you this morning. I'm Chris Bryant, the senior pastor here. And we're starting a new series uh, for the next three weeks called Three Questions. And uh, to just cover the context, it's why do I need Jesus? Why do I need the church? Why do I need this church? And it's my first attempt in an apologetic series, apologetic theme, uh, since I came to be your pastor in June. Apologetics means defense of the faith. And, um, but to clarify, what I'm talking about is, is my hope and my goal by the end of three weeks is that you'll somehow be empowered, inspired, equipped, encouraged, emboldened to answer these questions yourself and to do so in a way that's thoughtful and respectful that you could articulate better, more soundly, or with greater confidence your answers when asked to someone else. Puts me in mind of 1 Peter 3.15. I want you to live into this verse for this series. 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be ready. Always be ready to give an account, to make a defense. To anyone who asks... Now notice it's to those who ask, so we're not forcing ourselves on anyone. That's an important part. But, but to those who would ask, make a defense, give an account for the reason of the hope that is in you. But do so with gentleness and respect. I love that. And so that's my hope. That's my aim for the next three weeks with you. And I'm thinking about several groups of people with this sermon series. I'm thinking about um, folks that have been Christian for a long time. They have been um, Christian for years, perhaps decades, maybe even members of the church for that long. I'm, I'm thinking of you if that's you, and my heart is with you because I think a lot of times people in that category, when they're presented with these kinds of sermons and, and these opportunities, well, I think you talk yourselves out of it. At my experience as a pastor, as a folks who have been in the faith for a long time, not everybody, of course, but an awful lot of folks, they kind of, well, they feel bad about their witness. They essentially feel like they have nothing to offer. They say things like, well, I've always been in church, or I've been a Christian for so long, I can never remember not being. Or they'll say, um, well, I don't know what else I'd be. And, and the thing is that you've made a choice. If you're in that group, you, you at some point in time decided to be a Christian, you decided to be a churchgoer, and you know what? You've decided ever since. You've continued to decide every single day, every single week, and there are reasons for that. And I hope in the next few weeks I can teach you or help you or inspire you to think about those reasons because we need your witness. We need those Christians that have been Christians for decades to help us see through the chaos and the ever-changing world that we live in. We need their consistency and their commitment. And so I hope to help you if you're in that category. I also hope to help the others of you that are in a different category. Maybe you're new Christians or new to the faith, relatively speaking, compared to maybe that other group. Maybe you've been coming for a few years or a few months or a few weeks. Or, or, or maybe you've been coming long enough that you're kind of embarrassed at this point. You think, you know what, I should be able to answer those three questions. Why do, people, why do I need Jesus? Why do I need the church? Why do I need this church? I, I, and I feel like maybe I could answer them, but I'm, I'm a little bit scared to try. So in fact, I, I'm, I'm intimidated by that because I feel like I probably should be able to do a better job than I can. And so I'm thinking about you, if that fits you. I'm thinking about you in this sermon series and how I might be, help you and inspire you and encourage you by saying something to get your motor going, get your juices flowing, so that you might do a better job at giving a reason for the hope that's within you. And lastly, I'm thinking about the group of folks that 
that are in every church and everywhere I've gone as a pastor, I've always met folks like this. I, they're, they're closet Christians or closet atheists. And, and if you're not a closet atheist, you're an outright atheist or an outright, you know, and that's well, welcome. We're glad that you're here today. But I also, as a pastor, I've met folks that, well, basically what they say is something like this. They say, you know what, I, I don't know whether I'm really a Christian or not. Now, they wouldn't tell people this. They keep it to themselves, but this is what they think. They think, you know, on, on good days, good days, maybe I am a Christian. And on bad days, I'm pretty sure I'm not. And I want to talk to you in this series as well. I want to inspire you. And my hope is at the end of the day, you're, really, you're willing to dive in a little bit more, dive in a little bit deeper than you ever have before with this Christian faith. All right, so why do people need Jesus? Well, it's interesting. Um, why people need Jesus, it's, it's oftentimes um, we start off in the wrong place. Uh, when it comes to, to uh, people needing Jesus, uh, we assume that people have an understanding of faith, of spirituality, of even something as simple as sin. Or at least this is what I've witnessed. And maybe you've witnessed it too. Uh, the people talk about, well, you, you, know, you have to talk about sin, and Jesus is the answer to sin, and there's, there's all kinds of different ways that people describe this, and that Jesus kind of fills the gap. And, but see, there's, there's, there's a couple problems with that. Number one is that in most people in our culture, they don't identify themselves as sinners. Now, you and I might understand that word if you've been in church at all in your life. You've come to recognize sinning or the word sin or being a sinner as something synonymous with not being perfect. And so it's an okay word for you. You're comfortable with it. You, you understand that it just means that you're, you've missed the mark. There's a way to be, a way to go in life, and you've, you've, you've strayed from that path. And that your tendency is to stray from that path. But see, the rest of the world, they, especially in our culture, people that are not immersed in that kind of language... Well, when they, hear the word, when they hear the word sinner, they think of really bad person. And so if you ask them, are you a sinner, they'll say, no. Because that's what they think of. They think of a really bad person. That's what they think it means. And so right away, we're at a disconnect here. We're not speaking the same language. Sometimes people are just offended by the, the, you know, the, the, the suggestion, you know, you need Jesus. Well, I don't blame them, Right? I mean, we very purposely chose the wording for the series as not why people or why you need Jesus, but why I need Jesus. It's, it's much more helpful to begin any conversation with someone, not with what they should do or what they need, but simply saying, well, this is what I believe I need. That changes the conversation drastically. When you're not trying to force anybody to do anything they don't want to do, but simply sharing how you feel, how you've come to understand things, why I need Jesus. And that's really important. You know, I was at the... Um, Haunted Depot last night, and uh, with my boys, we experienced that for the first time, and, and uh, it was pretty good, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but um, we, uh, there was a gentleman outside uh, that had a sign and was street preaching, I suppose. Um, to be honest with you, I didn't listen a lot to what he was saying. And I have nothing against that gentleman, and, and I think there was a woman that was holding a sign for a while, and maybe if this is this gentleman's family, or maybe it's his church, and I don't blame him for his convictions. I mean, if that's what he feels convicted to do, go for it. But here's the thing. My sense is that for every one person that might listen to that, that guy, I bet there's at least a hundred others that look at him and say, I'll never be a Christian, if that's what it means. Amen. And so what I share with you today, what I hope for you to do is to, to help you answer for you why you need Jesus. And as we walk through that, I think you'll find people want to listen because they're interested in your story. You're human. You're not a preacher like me. You're just a regular person. <laughs> and they're willing, they'd be willing to hear your story. They'd be willing to hear what you think and why, why you feel the way you feel. And so we don't want to start off on the wrong assumptions that often where those conversations go, where it begins with the John 3.16 and where you're going to go when you die. And that I, I, you know, and, and people use that sometimes because it, it was a Billy Graham technique, but what people forget is that Billy Graham used that line after 45 minutes to an hour of preaching about God's love and God's presence. I mean, people were ready to come. So 
I think we should start off on a different set of assumptions. And where I would suggest to do is, is for you to just begin thinking about why you believe in God. And if you believe in God, what is that God like? Now, here's the thing. Even the people who are not yet Christians, um, they often believe in God, or they would like to believe in God. Or even if they're not so certain there is a God, they can speculate and begin to think about, well, if there is a God, what do you think that God might be like? And it's interesting, in our culture specifically, there's at least three characteristics that come up all the time. And that is that God is love. People like to believe or hope to believe that if there is a God, that God is love. And that this God is personable. That you can personally know and speak with this God. That this God would know you and you could interact with this God. And that thirdly, that this God has something to do with an afterlife that in some way relates to the way life is here and now. That essentially whatever the afterlife is, we don't lose ourselves. That we somehow retain identity We may not be exactly the same, but I still recognize myself as Chris, and other people recognize me as Chris in the hereafter. Now, those are three really distinct concepts that are uniquely Christian. Now, see, we're starting off with a different set of assumptions. A lot of people assume these things, or or we can begin dialogue there because that's what people like about God, but those, those are uniquely Christian claims. That God is unconditional, agape, love. And that God is knowable. That's an amazing claim that the God that would create all things could be personally known. What a bizarre idea. Except that for Christians, we found Jesus Christ and then the indwelling of a Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of God. And so we believe that God can be personally known because we don't have to reach to heaven. Heaven comes to us. And I'll end the sermon that way today. And then... This idea of the afterlife, the idea that we can exist beyond this life and yet retain who we are. Again, a very unique concept. And and so if we can begin there, we can begin with these questions. You know, if you believe in a God, what is that God like? How does this God interact with the world? How do you know? And now let's do something fun. Let's take away Jesus of Nazareth. Let's just imagine academically for a few moments that Jesus of Nazareth never existed. Now how do you feel about God? How certain are you that God is a God of love? How certain are you that God can be personally known? How certain are you that there's an afterlife? How certain are you of much of anything? Now, to be fair to Jesus, Jesus would undoubtedly say to me right now, in fact, I believe he is, I believe the Holy Spirit has spoken to me and makes me to qualify my remarks right now, that Jesus would say, Chris, seriously? I did not come inventing God. The God that has always been, the one whom I call Father, that is Papa, Daddy, and who I say you can pray, our Papa, is clearly known and can be seen in the law and the prophets. You just have to have the right eyes. And if you just have the right eyes, you can look around to all of creations and see God's grace and God's wonder and God's beauty. Come on, Chris. And of course, I would say, well, yes, of course, Jesus, thank you. But thank you, Jesus, for explaining that because I don't get it on my own. You see, we need Jesus. That's where would we be and where would most people be? This is a good place to start when we begin to think about who is God? What is God like? What is the nature and character of the divine? And for me, I say, well, I looked at Jesus in him and his life and what he said and what he did. I've, under, I've began to understand what God looks like because Jesus told stories about a prodigal son that came home to a father that would not give up looking for him. He told stories about the good Samaritan, the one that was the most unlikely character that ended up being the hero And Jesus says, do this, because this is what your Father instructs. This is what God means when he says, love me by loving each other. Be that. He he tells stories like the shepherd who leaves the 99 to go after the one. He heals the blind. He makes the lame well again. He feeds the hungry. He tells the little children, don't hinder them not, but let them come unto me. He gets the better of the religious people and the people, the know-it-alls. He gets the better of them. And he doesn't return evil for evil, but good for evil. And in the end, in the end, his life is taken from him. Of all the powerful things he did, 
calming the wind and the rain and the storms. Of all the powerful things, feeding the 5,000, the most powerful thing he did is to hang powerless on a cross and so extinguish evil. And that's how evil is defeated in the way it only can be defeated, in the way we desperately want it to be defeated, not by fighting back, not by who's the strongest or the most powerful, who has the most weapons, but instead evil is vanquished by the one who says, do your worst. And evil is extinguished, poured out upon the Son of God, vanquished through exhaustion, emptied upon the cross of Christ. And Christ is raised. You and I, we need that story. All human beings need that story. To believe that good will overcome, that evil will not have the last word, that just have faith, even if things are not righted in my life, one day they shall be. This is the story. This is the human story. Jesus, we need Jesus because in him God is revealed. In him God is received. Whether we're our very first step in our spiritual journey or well into it, Jesus makes the journey possible. We're searching for God. The idea, why do we need Jesus, begins with the question, why do we need God? And Jesus is, yeah, and this is what God looks like. That's why we need Jesus. In him, we have the best picture of God we'll ever get. In him, we have also the perfect human response. Clearly, we see who God is. God is revealed. And clearly, we see how we're to respond In Jesus, God is revealed and God is received. Here's how the ancient Christians described him. He is the light of the world. This is what they meant by it. He's the bread of heaven, the bread of life. He's the the good shepherd. He's the great physician. He's the, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He's the bright and morning star. He is the heavenly high priest. He's the chief cornerstone. He is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's what they meant by it. In Jesus, we see God finally, a picture of God worth believing in. In Jesus, we see the human response. In Jesus, we see our great need for God. And in Jesus, we see a great God who meets our needs. In Jesus. And then we see other things. Because the Savior begins to confront us as we start our journey in Christ towards God and discovering who God is and how we should be able to respond. We find out interesting things. We find a Savior that points out to us through his stories and his deeds, and certainly in his death and his glorious resurrection, how things are wrong in this world, how things that should be one way and they're not. And the more we study and learn, we discover. We're part of what's wrong. In Jesus, we learn how precious and wonderful that we are, that we are, in fact, a child of God. We may not receive it or understand it, but we are uniquely and wonderfully made. And in Jesus, we also see I'm part of the forces that were in collusion to kill him. And I don't want to be. And so Jesus confronts us with this. His his life, his work, certainly in his death, he confronts us. And I say, I don't want to be like that anymore. And he forgives me. And his spirit fills me. And he says, now go and sin no more. Go and love your enemies. Go and bless those who would persecute you and pray for those who would spitefully use you. Go and defend the poor and defend the, the widow and defend the orphan. Go and make things right. And so in him, I also become the very child of God that he's already claimed I am. In Jesus, we receive the God that he reveals, and we're changed into God's people. And this is what the prophet Jeremiah talked about. This is what the prophet felt the Spirit speaking to him on behalf of God, that that one day was coming when when God would no longer try to to give us his, his law the way things should be and correct the way things are through words on stone or in letter. But God dreams, no, 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 I know there's a, there's a day that's coming where I'm going to do something so great and so amazing that you're going to find inside within you a burning desire to do my will. You're going to find a burning desire in you to have my values. You're going to want what I want to do what I do. You will be my people and I will be your God. My law will be on your mind and your hearts. And we Christians say, yes, it's in Jesus this happens. 
In Jesus, heaven comes to earth. In Jesus, heaven comes to me and gets in me and starts working on me. I heard a story not long ago. Excuse me, I heard a story long ago that I thought I would share with you today. A Christian in South China had a rice field in the middle of a hill. In the time of drought, he used a water wheel worked by a treadmill to lift water from the irrigation stream into his field. Now his neighbor owned the two fields beneath his. One night, his neighbor made a breach in the wall of his field in the dividing bank and drained the water from his field down to the two lower fields that the neighbor owned. The next day when the Christian got up and saw what happened, he repaired the breach in his own yard, in his own uh, field rather, and pumped the water back into his field because of course it had emptied. And yet when the lower fields needed watering again, his neighbor once again broke down the breach so that the water flowed from the top field down to the two below it. This happened three or four times. Until finally the Christian approached his neighbor and said to him, I've tried to be patient and not retaliate, but what is this that you are doing? It's, a, it's not right. And after that conversation, the Christian left and then prayed. As he prayed about it, he realized if all he had done and all he would do was seek his own justice, he would be a very poor follower of Jesus. So when the next time came for watering, he first pumped water into the two lower fields. And then, finally, into his own. After that day, two things happened. First is, he never once again had to worry about repairing the breach in his field. And the second thing is, his neighbor became a Christian. Everybody needs Jesus. Sometimes when we talk about needing Jesus, it's almost implied that what we mean is not Christians. As if we're done with him as if we've gotten everything we need out of him. And nothing can be further from the truth. I need Jesus. I need him. Jesus and the salvation he he offers is so much more than a personal escape plan in the event of my death. Too many people, when they claim to have accepted Christ, have merely accepted what I just said, a personal escape plan not realizing that that has nothing, almost nothing to do with Christian spirituality. Jesus did not come to give us insurance. What a sad state of Christianity if all we can describe is something that is akin to an insurance plan in the case of my death. Jesus came not to give us insurance, but assurance of God's presence in our lives. God is with us, his name is called. Though no matter what we're going through, we can have that confidence and that we can live for God, not ourselves. We can love our enemies. We can hold to the truth. We can be truth speakers and grace givers and be gracious with our lives. Even if it costs us our life, it's okay. We don't need to be afraid of death. For even in our death, his promises are true. God is with us. That's the meaning of Christian spirituality. When Jesus came preaching, he didn't come preaching Guess what? I've got great news. I've got the best escape plan possible. He came preaching, the kingdom of God is at hand. That was his message. The kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God. He says, it's at hand. Look, it's before you. Look at me. Look at what I hear, what I say. Look what I do. Look at my life. This is the rule and reign of God. And it's before you. It's possible to be in you. Friends, Jesus did not come to get us into heaven. Jesus came to get heaven into us. That's what we mean. Why else would he teach us to pray? Thy will be done, say it with me, on earth as it is in heaven. Why would he teach us to pray that? Our spirituality must be downward to the earth. The promise of eternal life It's not an escape plan, but rather one of the benefits that God is with us and that not even death can separate us from the love of God. That's the truth. Jesus came to save us now. All of us, we need you. I need Jesus today. I'm a much better person because of the Lord today. It's in Christ that we become the very children of God that God has called us to be. 
It's in Christ that I seek the God of my desires. I, I, I study Jesus and I find within me stirring all the deep yearnings of my heart, my soul. And it's in him that I find those desires are met. And then as I follow him, I find myself being changed by it. As I'm told who I am in him, in, in God, forgiven for all the ways in which I fall short, and then compelled to be better. I need Jesus. Jesus to came to save us from everything that we need to be saved from. Jesus came to save the whole world, including me. And then he's going to include me in the saving of the whole world. That's why I need Jesus. How about you? Why do you need Jesus? Let's pray. Lord, I'm thankful for this opportunity. And I pray as we come to your table we would be filled with a peace and a wonder, but we would come in an awe that what we can find in you is, a, is the God that the deepest longings of our heart is after, that you would stir on them with us and challenge us, even as we are met with compassion and met with encouragement and acceptance, that at the same time you would challenge us and see how we're at times in collusion with the forces of wickedness in this world. And yet in forgiving us and compelling us forward, giving us the power to, to be free of that. Wow. We need you. Lord, if there are those of us today that were perhaps inspired but uncertain of what, what the next step is, Lord, help them speak to them right now. And for any of us, of us here that are ready to to make a decision today, help us to do it. To say, I am a follower of Jesus. I'm a flawed, often failing, but nonetheless follower of his. And I want him and the heaven that he brings to enter into my heart and enter into my mind. That God's will and God's way would be written there. That my values would be the values of God and I would be part of his work in this world to save it. Indeed, Lord, your kingdom come on earth. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this prayer in the mighty name of Jesus and all of God's people say,